The Byzantine Empire lasted for over 1,100 years with 90 emperors. Hence this meant that it sure featured a good share of great emperors and terrible ones too. In this video will discuss my own personal worst 10 Byzantine emperors out of the 90, in which some are generally known for being extremely terrible and the rest known for having done terrible things that many might not know of. Although in fairness Byzantium really had a bigger share of better rulers than crappy ones. In this list, I will rank the emperors from my 10th worst downwards to my personal worst emperor, which shall be a surprise. To qualify for this list, the emperors have to come from the entire time period from 330 with the founding of the Byzantine Empire until 1453 with the fall of Constantinople to the Ottomans. Also, those emperors in this list have to have reigned long enough to have done a series of awful things in their reigns. Therefore, this video will not cover Byzantine emperors who just ruled for a year or two. Keep in mind too that a lot of the emperors I will discuss here may not be all well-known ones, and this is probably precisely the reason why they make it to this list. Here I will also not be covering rulers from the breakaway Byzantine Empire of Trebizond and the Despotate of Epirus, as well as rulers of the Latin Empire of Constantinople from 1204 to 1261, in which all were pretty much awful ones. Now before beginning this video, please don't forget to like, comment and subscribe to my channel if you want to see more Byzantine history videos as your support really helps in growing my channel. Now here's one emperor that many may not think of as a crappy one basically because he had a short reign of only 3 years from 1376 to 1379, but if you get to read up about him, he was pretty much useless and more so destructive for the already dying empire. Andronicus was the son of the 14th century Byzantine emperor John V Palaiologos, the emperor who made Byzantium an Ottoman vassal. Therefore the main reason to which Andronicus revolted against his father only to fail miserably and be imprisoned for 3 years from 1373 to 1376. With assistance from Genoa and the Ottomans, Andronicus broke out of prison in 1376 and thus took the throne from his father, but as emperor, he was pretty much useless as he was nothing more but a puppet of Genoa and in return for the Ottomans helping him, he gave up the entire Gallipoli Peninsula to them. Just 3 years into his reign, where he was known to have done really nothing, Andronicus lost the throne back to no other than his father John V. Although still not willing to give up, Andronicus held his mother, aunt and maternal grandfather the former Emperor John VI as hostages for the next two years until finally surrendering to his father in exchange for being given rule over Selimbria just next to Constantinople. Still, the hard-headed Andronicus did not give up as in 1385 he once again declared rebellion against his father only to this time fail as he suddenly dropped dead. It is for the reason of stirring up trouble and making things worse rather than doing what he can to help when Byzantium was really at its lowest point, why I put Andronicus IV in this list of my worst emperors. But no matter how bad and selfish he reigned, there are far worse emperors than him. Here's an emperor that ruled the Byzantine Empire at a terrible time yet did nothing really to help reverse the situation it was in. Following the disastrous Battle of Manzikert in 1071, which saw the Byzantines lose most of their heartland, Asia Minor, and a strong emperor too being Romanos IV Diogenes, who after losing this battle and a Byzantine civil war was therefore blinded leading to his death. The young and inexperienced Michael VII Ducas came to rule the empire. Michael VII, to put it short, was the bookish type who'd rather spend his time doing scholarly pursuits, but his reign was plagued by enemy invasions on all sides, especially by the Seljuk Turks in Asia Minor, the Pechenegs in the Balkans, and much worse a rogue Norman mercenary claiming land in Asia Minor as his own. With all these troubles happening around him, Michael VII did nothing really. Instead, he made things possibly worse as seen by offering the Seljuks land in Asia Minor in exchange for defeating that same rogue Norman who wasn't even really dealt with. The worst part about his reign though was that it saw the Solidus, the Empire's standard gold currency, be devalued by a full quarter, hence earning Michael the nickname Parapinakis, or minus a quarter. As Emperor, Michael surely did not run the Empire, rather the job of running it was left to more able though corrupt men, such as his uncle John Ducas, Michael Selos, and the eunuch Nikiforitsis, which thus meant the Empire was really falling apart. True enough, the weak Michael VII wasn't able to hold his empire together with all the invasions, court intrigue, corruption, and economic decline that soon enough a number of generals rebelled against his rule, with the victor being the old man Nikephoros Botaniates, 
who in 1078 overthrew Michael, forcing him to be a monk. Though the new emperor, Nikephoros III, wasn't any better, and so just three years later, in 1081, he was overthrown by the young general, Alexios Komnenos, who would therefore be the one to save the empire from this age of decline. Isaac II Angelos was one emperor who may or may not be considered the terrible one, as true enough he was still willing to do anything to save his empire, though his way of ruling wasn't entirely an effective one. Isaac II's reign had a bright beginning once he overthrew the madman emperor Andronikos I Komnenos, who was thus hacked to death by Constantinople's people while the invading Normans too were defeated. Although it was his generals that did it, but not him. However, Isaac II's 10-year reign would not be as bright as it saw generals rebelling against his rule left and right the loss of territory to enemies, and Bulgaria itself declaring independence from the empire. In fairness, Isaac II managed to stay in power for 10 full years, but he wasn't entirely effective in holding the empire together, though at least he still tried, especially in doing all he could to return Bulgaria to the empire. However, he never succeeded. Part of Isaac II's 10-year reign too included the Third Crusade, which did more harm than good as the German armies of the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick Barbarossa passed Byzantine lands. But the worst part of his reign, though, was how corruption ran rampant in the empire that government positions were now sold like goods in the market. In 1195, after 10 years of a mediocre reign, Isaac was suddenly usurped, blinded and imprisoned by his older brother Alexios III, who turned out to be even worse than Isaac, keep it in mind, he will be discussed later. But this was not yet the end for Isaac. Apparently, Isaac's son, also named Alexios, who was imprisoned with his father, managed to escape and find himself in Venice where he ended up diverting the Fourth Crusade to Constantinople in an act to oust his uncle and restore he and his father to power. Although Isaac II, despite being blind, was restored as emperor together with his son, Alexios IV, it was too late as Alexios IV had turned out to bring hell to Constantinople through the Fourth Crusade who he promised to pay but lacked the funds to do so. Within just a number of months, Alexios IV fell from power as the people revolted against him for agreeing to pay off the crusaders. Thus soon enough Alexios IV was executed in prison, while his father Isaac died of a heart attack when hearing of his son's death, and what followed this was the tragic sack of Constantinople by the army of the Fourth Crusade in 1204, and following that the temporary collapse of the Byzantine Empire until its restoration in 1261. Although having no bad intentions, the 11th century emperor Romanos III Argyros still makes it to this list due to the disasters that occurred in his reign all because of his delusions. Now the nobleman Romanos Argyros, who was the mayor of Constantinople, became emperor in 1028 after marrying Empress Zoe, the daughter of the emperor Constantine VIII of the Macedonian dynasty, the younger brother of the legendary emperor Basil II. Having no sons, Constantine VIII forced Romanos to divorce his wife or else be blinded or marry Zoe who despite being already 50 still remained unmarried. Following Constantine's death, Romanos III succeeded him as emperor and despite the imperial couple's old age, they still tried in vain to have children to the point of using sorcery. As emperor, Romanos III had a lot to prove, especially since he wanted to emulate the legendary Roman emperors of the past, such as Trajan in terms of military strength and Marcus Aurelius in being a philosopher. In an act to prove his ability, Romanos III foolishly declared war on Byzantium's Arab vassal Aleppo only to lose miserably in battle and flee back to the capital like a coward. To make up for this disaster, Romanos III uselessly spent the treasury in building a massive church in the capital which would be his resting place. True enough, Romanos III soon met his end when his wife the Empress Zoe and her young lover Michael the Paphlagonian plotted his assassination wherein Romanos was drowned to death in his bath. Following this, Zoe immediately married Michael and after bribing the patriarch, the lowborn Michael IV was crowned as the new emperor, and ironically, Romanos was laid to rest in the massive church he had built. Constantine VI of the Isaurian dynasty The son of Emperor Leo IV and Empress Irene now deserves a spot in this list for basically screwing up during the time he was emperor. In fairness to him, he was only 9 years old when becoming emperor in 780 following his father Leo IV's death. And due to his young age, his mother Irene basically ran the empire for him. And true enough, she wanted things to remain this way, so that she can stay in power for as long as she wanted. Therefore, Constantine basically did not have any training to be the emperor. In 790, as Constantine VI came of age, he now attempted to rule on his own, and thus banished his mother. However, he proved completely incapable, as for one, the Byzantine army lost a humiliating defeat to the Arabs, and in 792, the army led by Constantine himself was defeated terribly by the Bulgarians at the Battle of Markele. 
This defeat then led to a movement to proclaim Constantine's uncle Nikephoros as emperor against him, but Constantine was able to put this coup down by having Nikephoros brutally blinded and his other uncle's tongues cut out, while opposition against him was brutally crushed. Eventually, Irene was restored to power as regent due to her son's brutality and incompetence. Though Constantine still did not stop his troublemaking, part of the troubles he caused included divorcing his wife and marrying his mistress, which the church firmly stood against, therefore leading to Constantine losing the church support. Eventually, Irene had enough of her son that in 797 she finally did away with him by blinding him so brutally that it was said that the blinding cost Constantine's death. However, he may have survived it, but remained in exile until his death in 805. Now, Constantine VI serves to be on this list, mostly due to his incompetence as emperor and how poorly he ran the empire, though he still did not really deserve that kind of fate of being blinded so brutally. Although again he had no bad intentions as emperor, his very long reign of 46 years saw more harm done to the Byzantine Empire than good, though it was not his fault. Andronicus II Palaiologus, though deserves a spot in this list, as his very long reign was literally full of unfortunate events, which he failed to stop. It's not entirely all his fault though, as when Andronicus II came to power in 1282, Byzantium was already in a troubled state, as his father, the previous emperor Michael VIII, left what was left of Asia Minor, the Byzantine heartland, undefended, and the treasury almost empty. As emperor, Andronicus II had to rule an empire low in funds and threatened by enemies everywhere, yet his only solution to fix the empire's problems was to hire mercenaries into the army to take care of these external threats, namely the Turks in Asia Minor. One instance that makes his reign an awful one was seen when he hired the untrustworthy band of Catalan mercenaries to deal with the Turks in Asia Minor. But at the end, despite the mercenaries subduing the Turks, these mercenaries just caused trouble for the Byzantines, resulting in what is left of Byzantine Thrace pillaged and burned. Andronicus II thus was left with a broken empire to rule, which was facing an economic crisis, and despite continuing to stay in power, he did nothing to solve the problems of the empire but rather raised taxes instead, to the point that his people all grew tired of his rule. The practically incompetent emperor Andronicus II, despite ruling for so long, sure enough lost the throne in 1328 to his grandson Andronicus III, who won the civil war against him. Andronicus II's very long reign sure enough saw the Byzantine Empire gradually decline, yet he was powerless to stop this decline, while he also lacked the ability and determination to save his empire, hence he deserves to be on this list. But at least his grandson and successor Andronicus III still did much better than his grandfather did in attempting to reverse the tragic situation Byzantium was in. Perhaps one of the bloodiest Byzantine emperors, Andronicus I Komnenos makes it to this list simply because of how much blood was shed in his reign. Yet he did not do any better, but much worse for the empire as a whole. Andronicus Komnenos, before he was emperor, was someone who always meant trouble towards his cousin, the emperor Manuel I Komnenos, thus forcing Andronicus to flee the empire a number of times to avoid the consequences. However, following Manuel I's death in 1180, Andronicus came back in full force as the empire was in a troubled state wherein it was ruled by Manuel's young son, Alexios II, and his foreign Latin mother, Maria of Antioch, who were both unpopular among the people. Andronicus, pretending to be the champion of his people's anti-Latin and pro-Greek sentiments targeted against the young emperor and his mother, easily stormed into Constantinople, and what followed his entrance to the capital was a brutal massacre of its Latin inhabitants in 1182, all in the name of Andronicus. Following this, Andronicus successfully seized power by arresting and executing the empress, and in the following year, killing off his nephew, the young Alexios II himself, and to make himself legitimate, he married Alexis's widow, the 12-year-old Agnes of France, despite Andronicus already being in his 60s. As emperor, Andronicus sure enough did not rule to champion his people's pro-Greek and anti-Latin sentiments, as rather he just used it as a way to get himself in power. And now as emperor, he plainly focused on purging the aristocracy and their corruption, not to make things better anyway, as all he cared about was to undo everything his late cousin Manuel achieved. In Andronicus first rather short two-year reign, not a day went by without someone being jailed, tortured, or executed for saying the slightest thing against the emperor, or for the slightest kind of corruption, wherein many were executed in the most gruesome of ways. However, within just two years on the throne, Andronicus lost it, due to his paranoia, as when hearing a prophecy that the young Isaac Angelos would overthrow him. He had Isaac arrested, only for the attempt to fail, as Isaac killed the men sent to arrest him, fled to the Hagia Sophia, and was proclaimed emperor against Andronicus. Shortly after, Andronicus met a gruesome end fitting for the bloody way he ruled, 
as he was tortured to death for days, ironically by the same people that put him in power three years earlier. The classic example of a neglectful and incompetent piece of crap emperor who clearly did nothing worth remembering. Although a general by profession, Constantine Ducas really had no military experience. Rather, he only came to power in 1059 by the choice of the previous emperor, Isaac I Komnenos, who, due to sickness, abdicated in favor of him. As emperor, Constantine X did more harm than good to the empire, as seen when he disbanded Byzantium's eastern army in exchange for hiring foreign mercenaries at the worst time possible, as right when he disbanded the army, a new major enemy being the Seljuk Turks, led by their sultan Alp Arslan, had just invaded the Byzantine heartland Asia Minor. Much worse, during Constantine X's reign, the Armenian city Ani was sacked by the Seljuks due to the emperor's disbanding of the army, and following this, the threat of the invading Seljuk Turks just got worse and worse, and so did the threat of the Pechenegs in the Balkans and Normans in Italy. Rather than finding ways to solve the crisis the empire was in, Constantine X instead obsessed on religious matters and in trying to keep his family in power, that before his death in 1067, he made his wife, the Empress Eudokia, swear to never remarry. And true enough, she was true to the oath for at least a few months, as true to the dire situation the empire was in, with the Seljuks invading Asia Minor, the Pechenegs overrunning the Balkans, and the Normans about to capture all of Byzantine Italy, Eudokia had no choice but to marry a strong general who would be the next emperor, Romanos IV Diogenes. But unfortunately, he would be a victim of a conspiracy by the Ducas family, leading him to lose to the Seljuks at the fateful Battle of Manskirt and later be blinded by the Duke's supporters in 1072. Not to mention Constantine X's son, who was the same incompetent Michael VII Ducas mentioned earlier, who did just as bad as his father in running the empire. Another emperor most notable for being an incompetent piece of crap with no redeeming qualities to think of. First of all, Alexios III Angelos had no chance in becoming emperor until his younger brother Isaac did in 1185, and it only so happened that Alexios came into the imperial scene when his brother the Emperor Isaac paid his ransom and brought him back to the Byzantine Empire as Alexios had been a captive in the Middle East for some time. And rather than thanking his brother for rescuing him, Alexios in 1195 conspired against him. In a plot that successfully blinded in the post Isaac, thus Alexios III took the throne. Despite wanting to steal the throne from his younger brother so badly, as Emperor Alexios III did not seem to care about ruling. Rather, the job was left to his wife and a number of aristocrats who plotted to depose Isaac in the first place. When in power, Alexios III literally neglected the army and navy, to the point that the navy literally rotted away, spent the taxes and lavishly but uselessly decorating the capital, and most notably looted the tombs of the past emperors in order to pay off a tax to the Holy Roman Emperor to prevent an invasion which however never happened, as the said Holy Roman Emperor died before he could get his plans into motion. Though Alexios III instead used the money he looted to pay off tribute to the threatening Seljuk Turks in the east. It was in Alexios III's reign too when the army of the 4th Crusade arrived outside Constantinople in 1203, and being the useless coward he was, Alexios did not put up a fight against the Crusaders, rather he fled the city with the treasury, with Constantinople having fallen to the Crusaders in 1204. Alexios III was still out there to cause some trouble in an act to take the Byzantine throne back for himself. But at the end he lost, as his ally then, the Seljuks were defeated by the new exiled Byzantine Empire of Nicaea in 1211, and with his ally gone, Alexios was forced to retire to a monastery, where he died in the same year. and the worst Byzantine Emperor spot goes to no other than Phocas, literally the ass, if there is any better way to describe him. Originally just a low-ranking centurion in Byzantium's Danube army, the inexperienced Phocas, who turned out to be a popular figure among the disgruntled troops, was hailed as Emperor by these said troops that no longer wanted to continue the Danube campaign against the Avars in 602, rather than continuing the fight. Phocas and his men marched to Constantinople, where the people now rioted in favor of Phocas against the Emperor Maurice. Eventually, Maurice was deposed and executed by Phocas, who now usurped the throne with no legitimate claim. And to make things worse, the usurpation of Phocas led to Maurice's ally, the Sassanid ruler Khosrow II, to declare an all-out war against Byzantium to avenge Maurice. 
Of course, by having no such experience in ruling, Focus did not seem to care about the looming Sassanid threat that when an army he sent to stop them was defeated, he surely didn't give a damn. In his eight years as emperor, Byzantine territory in the east was overrun by the Sassanids, the Balkans by the Avars and Slavs, and Italy by the Lombards. Yet the incompetent emperor Focus rather than doing something to stop these problems plainly focused on consolidating his rule by stamping out any kind of opposition against him no matter how small. As emperor, Focus was surely a cruel one. With no such vision for the empire as a whole, except to keep himself in power, thus problems kept growing and growing while he did nothing to stop it but instead make them worse. At least the good-for-nothing usurper Focus met a fitting end as he was usurped and therefore brutally executed by Heraclius in 610, who came to save the empire from all internal and external threats before it was too late. It is really for the reason that Focus literally did not do anything to save his empire at the worst time possible but instead focus on keeping himself in power to why he is my worst emperor. Yet he becoming emperor had literally led Byzantium to a downward spiral in the long term. Well this is basically it for this video on my top 10 worst Byzantine emperors. If you agree or disagree with my list here, please put your opinion down in the comments. I'd love to see what you think of my list. Also, I hope you all enjoyed this video as well as felt disgusted by the terrible deeds of these emperors. And of course, please don't forget to like, leave a comment, share and of course subscribe to my channel if you're interested in Byzantine history. And once again, thank you and goodbye.